Um, could you explain um, the relevant areas of Sharia law um, that involve an element of capital punishment? Ah, all the best bits. <laughs> <laughs> There is a clear incompatibility. It can't be accommodated as long as we're still part of the European human rights system. The, the, the Sharia law thing, I, I'm sure people are familiar that there are Jewish courts in the UK. And, and you never hear the question, why Jewish courts? Would that not be him not being able to practice, for example, his religious beliefs? Like, how, where do you draw the line? Of apostates is misunderstood in Islam. It's best translated as treason against the state. That is the best, that is a better translation. Well, I mean, theoretically, I think uh, in America it's still outlawed treason, and in some places it could be killed. Uh, you could be killed for, for treason against the state. So, doesn't make it right. Well, um, I, I don't think you've a basis. The state's wrong. Uh, that's that's my point. Um, people believe that so the con you know, liberalism as ideology is is, uh, is defined by its tolerance. But by necessity, it actually is intolerant, and, it, and, it, and it, you know it's, it has to be by its, its creed. Because if it's not, if something is not liberal, according to liberal worldview, that's injustice. And then how can liberalism tolerate injustice? And hence, it has to then start to impose itself or deny um, other systems to exist because they're not liberal. The Jewish community have been advocating for the needs of their community for well over two thousand years. We've been living. In, un, under the rule of other countries for well over 2,000 years. Uh, yeah, well, I guess uh, liberalism has actually taken quite a bashing tonight. I think it's. I think you're being a bit harsh on not Western society. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought I was uh, being gentle. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs>
And um, just to start, um, Abdullah, for the um, benefit of the audience, um, could you explain um, the relevant areas of Sharia law um, that involve an element of capital punishment? Ah, all the best bits. <laughs> right. Well, um, okay. I, I, I suppose one of the problems with dealing with cap the capital law issue on, on, in, in Sharia is um, people folk jump straight to that and not look at the kind of uh, conception of, of human nature, the, cons the, the political philosophy of, of Sharia and Islamic system, um, that we, we uh, don't look at the uh, we don't believe in the understanding that humans are um, inherently um, or purely individualistic, but also they are, we are social creatures. Uh, we weren't born as individuals, but we came into this, into this world by means of other humans. And our, most of your personality, most of our, of our kind of uh, characteristics were determined um, for us or taught to us or inculcated uh, in us uh, by our parents and our society. Hence, there is always cultural similarities across um, you know, different regions, different countries and so on. So uh, we, don't, you know, we have a different paradigm when it comes to looking at human beings. Uh, we have different uh, values for um, ac human actions. So if a, if a human basically does an action which completely does not affect anyone else in any way, shape or form, then generally speaking, the, the political aspects of Sharia don't interfere in that person's life. So if you want to drink alcohol or uh, engage in, in uh, same gender intercourse or whatever, the, or, or illicit intercourse and so on inside your own house, the political Sharia doesn't interfere. It doesn't concern what, what, you know, itself with what you're doing in your own house. But rather, the only, thing, the only aspects that the Sharia concerns itself with is the, the public square, the public sphere. So if you basically, um, obviously, you know, uh, engage in illicit acts in public, for example, both in terms of you know, dealing, uh, dealing in more commonplace economic problems, such as interest, which obviously we, we, pro we prohibit interest, but also dealing in illicit acts in public, that's also prohibited. And uh, even under English law, you can't do illicit acts in public as well. Public indecency laws prevent you from doing the same thing. So what people don't understand is that when it comes to prohibiting illicit acts in, in, in the kind of political society, the Sharia and current Western systems actually agree that there are certain things you don't do in public. You know, you will be arrested for that and, you know, uh, and then prosecuted. But in terms of the, the private sphere, and strictly the private sphere, the Sharia does not, does not uh, deal with that. Now, I suppose, dealing with the actual capital punishment aspect of the, of the Sharia, why, why does the Sharia believe in capital punishment? It's because uh, it's, we believe it's a more humane alternative to locking someone up in a human zoo for the rest of their life, if they commit murder, for example. Um, John Stuart Mill argued uh, as well on his uh, speech against, cap against the abolition of capital punishment that it is more inhumane. It is more inhumane to uh, lock someone up in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a cage for the rest of their life because their suffering is perpetual. You're denying them their freedom and they are perpetually suffering. Now, if someone committed uh, a murder and you basically um, you know, executed them for committing murder, uh, then there is obviously an equality of justice, so they committed murder and hence they are murdered in return, and their suffering ends. So there is no perpetual suffering. And in, and in the Quran, we believe that uh, uh, oppression is worse than killing. So to make someone suffer in, in their life is worse than actually just killing them. Because when you kill someone, then their suffering ends. It's, it's unjust uh, to, kill, to kill people, obviously, for unjust causes, but um, suffering and oppression is worse. Uh, if, you, if you actually think about it. And so John Stuart Mill would, would agree with the Sharia on, on that aspect. Now, um, in, in, in terms of just the actual pun capital punishments themselves, uh, it's all designed as part of a system to be very you know, quick and, uh, and obviously as humane as possible and to uh, produce a deterrent to committing the crime. But what people don't know about is that in the Sharia, we also have the concept of forgiveness. So a victim's family... If you've killed someone in the victim's family, uh, then the victim's family can choose to forgive you, and you'll you'll be let off without no punishment. In uh, you know obviously liberal penal penal systems, there is no forgiveness. There can be no forgiveness. You will be punished. It doesn't matter who. No one can forgive you for your your crimes, short of probably presidential pardon, but you can't be forgiven, and so you will be punished. And uh, what we see is that from the, the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, and in the Quran. Uh, he actually urges uh, believers to actually forgive instead of to punish, because if you actually forgive, then you, you know, someone else, then you deserve God's forgiveness in return. You're more deserving of God's forgiveness. So the Islam um, both spiritually encourages uh, individuals to actually forgive. So forgive people for killing a member of your family, and uh, and and uh, forgive them if they've stolen from you, and so on and so forth. So in a nutshell, anyway, that's kind of. Um, how Islam views the punishment systems, and because it has an aspect of, of spiritual values in it, 
um, you know, we do have uh, a place for forgiveness as opposed to just sternly punishing uh, you know, someone no matter what. Um, okay, no, <laughs> good. <laughs> um, okay, um, now I'm Dr. Elizabeth Craig. Um, I would like to um, suggest that that perhaps um, contradicts the um, European Convention on Human Rights, um, specifically Protocol 6 in particular, um, which abolishes um, outright the um, death penalty. Um, so with that in mind, what do you feel would be the appropriate method maybe for incorporating this area of Sharia law into Europe, or if it's possible at all? Um, I mean, I think it's a very good example um, to discuss first off, because it's, there is a clear incompatibility. I think a lot of the other issues we're likely to discuss um, so things like circumcision, things like wearing of religious clothing. Um, it's not always clear what the answer is from an international human rights law perspective in terms of is there, you know, because international human rights law, as most of you know, is very much about balancing of interests. Um, yes, we have rights, but those rights can be limited in order to protect the rights of others, etc. Um, but clearly, under European human rights law, there is a protocol to the ECHR. Um, it's a protocol that states choose whether or not to sign up to. Um, but I think most states, mm. most Europe, um, Council of Europe member states have, have done that. Apart from Russia, I believe. Okay. Sort of apart from Russia. Um, and there is a clear prohibition of the, of the death penalty. Um, And so actually, from an international human rights, or from a European human rights law perspective, um, that issue is actually, there's, a, there's an incompatibility. Um, and if we look at the situation at global level, um, you know, a lot of states globally do still have capital punishment. Um, but if we look at it at European level, there is there is a fundamental incompatibility there, and I don't I don't know how you accommodate it. I don't I don't think you can. Um, it's international human rights law works on the basis of state consent, states accede to or ratify international human rights treaties, and if they ratify a treaty that prohibits the death penalty as a matter of international law, that's that's the situation that should apply. I see. Um, so. Would you suggest that um, maybe that there should be like an open dialogue into perhaps giving some leeway, a bit more of a um, push towards um, maybe social libertarianism in a way that allows um, Muslims that um, practice Sharia law to um, be a part of this separate legal system for um, their personal discourses? Would you mm -hmm. say that would be accepted in an international, in the European sphere? I think the issue you're raising is a much more general issue um, because obviously Sharia law, you know, there has lots of implications for regulation of family life um, and all sorts of other areas, not just the one that we kind of started the discussion, the discussion with. Um, which I think takes us into a slightly different Area of, area of discussion which I don't know whether you want to go into at this stage um, but I would say in relation to capital punishment um, it can't be accommodated as long as we're still part of the European human rights system um. may, may, may I chime in um, uh, just to be, be clear I suppose um, as Muslims who obviously reside in, in the West um, the Sharia inform tells us that when you live in a land, obviously not based under uh, Islam, uh, that we don't, I mean, well, we, we, don't, we don't impose our beliefs on anyone. Even when within a land based on Islam, you don't um, impose your beliefs on, any, on anyone. Uh, we actually, um, you could say, pioneered, um, you know, multi, multiple legal systems running, uh, you know, parallel. So, uh, you know, Jews living in the Islamic uh, state and went through history had their own legal system, Christians had their own legal system, uh, Zoroastrians had their own legal system. Uh, Hindus, to various degrees, had their own legal system, and it was basically, um, you know, between within communities, they were allowed 
uh, to you know to live and judge according to their own systems, um, and you know this is historically documented. And this is how we kind of dealt with pluralism. Uh, if we what said, happens in those situations then when, say, uh, a Christian then does something to a Muslim or a Muslim does something to a Christian? What law is there to deal with those, that mixing then? Because surely it's not always going to be Muslim on Muslim or Christian on Christian. What um, happens? Does, which law? Uh, that would be according to the kind of uh, the, the negotiated uh, agreement um, kind of uh, prior to the incorporation of that community. So whenever, for example, Muslims, um, uh, they, they deposed, let's say, uh, uh, Byzantine Romans uh, controlling an area and they you know, liberate the people and then the people they came to a neg negotiation with these with these people for example and uh, they said all right well we'll live by x y and z and you'll uh, and so on if there's any disagreements or problems we'll refer it to this or that or this this uh, mutual compact and this is how it was arranged it was by it was by negotiation uh, and then sticking to that agreement the constitution of Medina which was the first uh, constitution of the first Islamic State by the, by the Prophet Muhammad he, uh, he actually it was actually an agreement between Muslims and Jews in that first constitution and so it talked about um, you know how they would relate and how they would not support enemies against each other and how they would have, you know, provide mutual defense so this is basically and that's that was how you resolve it now I think there's a, a philosopher I think it was a, a William E Connolly who, who is a critique of secularism uh, he himself also advocates something very similar to this, which is basically that we exist in a, pluralist, a plural of communities and we, all, we kind of negotiate with each other how we kind of uh, live with each other and coexist. And so that, uh, that would be very much what the Sharia advocates. But just, just to finish my, my last point very quickly is um, we don't believe in the imposition of our law system on uh, people in a non-Islamic country and we don't even believe it, uh, in position in a, an Islamic country, and there's many times the Prophet Muhammad has said many uh, words to this effect. He said, for example, anyone who oppresses or, or humiliates a, a non-Muslim citizen, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, he will not, he will not uh, be entered into paradise, and many, many such quotations like this. So, as as Muslims, we can't impose it. And even in the Quran, it, it mentioned that a time when some uh, Jews went to the Prophet Muhammad for a judgment for him to make a judgment between them, and he said basically to them, well, the Quran said in response, "Why are you coming?" Uh, to, the, to, to Muhammad for judgment when you have your Torah. So uh, this is how Islam would deal with you know, a plurality of different opinions. We don't believe in this totalitarian one law for all, because who makes that? That, that law is not, certainly not made by all. It's only made by a few people, and it's according to their own biases and prejudices. So this is why where Islam would, uh, Islamic opinions would be um, you know, held. Um. Rami, do you have something to contribute? Uh, yeah, actually, I've got a two-part question for Abdel, if you don't mind. Um, touching on your previous uh, comments, the first question I suppose I would have is, when you mentioned how uh, Sharia law is basically, it almost sounds to me like a libertarian kind of harm principle, where if whatever you do in your house, up to you, as long as it's not harming somebody else, as long as it's not shamed in the public sphere, so to speak. But, but what about in your own house, for example, if a young Muslim girl is caught by her father having sex before marriage with her boyfriend, and he beats her for his own pride and for the pride of his own family, how would Sharia deal with that? It happened in her household. But whose rights are more important than the rights of the father as you know, head of that household or the rights of that girl? Um, there's, no, there's, no real, there's no conception of, I suppose you might say, the conception of honor. Uh, it's, that's a more cultural conception. <coughs> um, in Islam, we believe in respect, not the idea of honor. So, someone um, in, this, you know, in Islam, you're, we're taught to be um, to have humility and not be prideful. Unfortunately, in, in many uh, you know countries today, um, in, which are Muslim, they have this very you know um, non-Islamic cultural perspective. Uh, we uh, you know which which um, we believe is non-Islamic, and we believe it's, it's due to many social reasons why it exists. So, how would Sharia, for example, punish that father for his behavior? Well, I mean, the, the, the daughter would have to go to the state and ask for re legal redress, and then it would be in accordance with, um, you know, be up to a judge to decide um, as to the appropriate redress uh, for, uh, for against the, the father and for the, for the, uh, the, the plaintiff. So, uh, just like in, in, in this society, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's not, Shari is not um, a kind of libertarian uh, concept. We don't believe in um, uh, material harm and benefit. We believe, you could say, in the bigger picture harm and benefit. Um, the, the Sharia is meant to um, aid people who want to live a religious life uh, from not um, facing difficulties or being uh, oppressed or prevented from doing so by other stimuli being enforced on them. You know, but wouldn't a state imposition, for example, on that father then be a stimuli? With then the state saying to him, 
why are you punishing your daughter? She has as much rights as you do. Would that not be him not being able to practice, for example, his religious beliefs? Like, like where do you draw the line? No, he, no that, what, that, wouldn't be, that wouldn't be his religious beliefs because Islam doesn't say that the, the father can beat um, his daughter, who's you know, a fully grown adult. We say, if she's, assuming she's an adult, of course, to have a boyfriend. Uh, well, she'd even be, if she's a child, for example, what if she's like 14, 15, 16? Well, in, uh, in this society, uh, if you have uh, a boyfriend and you're engaged in sexual relations before you, you reach um, 16 years old in the UK, that's actually punishable by British law. Well, we have so, an age of consent, though. Sorry? We do have an age of consent. Oh, you have. The two parties, for example, are of the same well, yeah, 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 yeah. consent legal. And well, I, guess, I guess one of the problems is when the parent argues that it is an integral part of his religious mm -hmm. beliefs. Um, like what would be the as an individual rather than... Like, 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 what would be an arbiter, a final arbiter, for example? Okay, well, it's like this. I mean, uh, you know, I assume most people here are law students. Mm -hmm. And so, as you know, there's so many interpretations on the law. What's the who's the final authority that determines what actually is the law? Well, it would be the UK government. Uh, or the by, Supreme Court, for instance. Yeah, by various means, that would then uh, impose its interpretation of uh, the principles of the law. And then we, we all have to accept, even if you disagree with it, we all have to accept. Now, this is just a part of human, uh, you know, the, the human's, uh, you know, political, na you know, nature. There's no way of avoiding. You have to. Someone has to say at one point, this is the interpretation we're going with. And the same thing in Islamic society, we have jurisprudence, and the jurisprudence, like like in Western jurisprudence, would have to make a decision on the matter, and then this matter would then become adopted in the state law. It's not adopted for all time. We don't believe that the state authority is sinless or, or divinely guided. It's prone to human error, can be changed. But just like in Western legal systems, it will have to be adopted by the, the elite. That's why we have government. The government adopts the law. But I mean, that does go against your statement when you said that Sharia doesn't abide by this one dictatorial law. You're saying it does the exact same thing as the Western laws, but then you're saying it doesn't do the exact same thing as the Western laws, and I guess that's what's no, causing me a bit of confusion. No, no. One, one law for all, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, which means that one law for, um, for Christians, Jews, and Muslims uh, uh, atheists and Buddhists and so on and so forth, even though, for example, atheists, Buddhists or Christians, Jews might not accept the basis for law, it would be wrong for me to say, you must follow uh, Islamic law because, um, you know, we're in power. Mm -hmm. That would that, be wrong. So that, that's where it's not this totalitarian one law for all. Within the Islamic, you, you know, di discourse, um, generally speaking, it is it's accepted amongst different schools of thought in Islam that you can adopt, uh, you can follow an opinion adopted by a leader Mm -hmm. uh, as long as he's a legitimately a legitimate leader, i.e. a caliph, mm -hmm. then he's allowed to adopt opinions and you have to abide by them even if you disagree. Right? And, this, and so um, there's no difference of opinion amongst uh, you know, kind of Islamic um, you know, schools of thought. So theoretically then the, the caliph is the final arbiter of the law? Um, in, in terms of, uh, not theologically, just politically. Okay, so if your politics and your theology, theology are bound together, then he's the final arbiter of the law. No, not in terms of the, your private sphere, for example, how you pray and your spiritual worships and things, but, but just concerning only aspects of the law which the, the, the caliph can legislate upon, like in any government, which is basically, you know, um, public transactions, economy, and so on. So but, forth. for example, that caliph, are they publicly appointed or elected? Or? Yeah, they're elected by the people. So they, can they be punished or removed? Yes. Okay, so it's very similar then to a Western system. Yeah, but just a different ideological basis. We don't, we don't have liberalism as the basis of the society we have. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's Islamic. Yeah, but Islamic I mean, belief. for instance, on, the, on a Western scale, we don't really adopt a religious religion, or sorry, uh, like, like a religious law anymore. I mean, if you look at the ECHR, considering that it protects every single religion equally and has like no actual religious basis, and this concept of liberalism ought not to be looked at as if it's a religious theology, but actually just a concept of human life, well, then I don't see why this would be an imposition law. If a law in its sphere aims to make every single religion equal, ought that law not be adopted then because it is the fairest law? Mm. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'll... Adding on top of that, um, could you see the potential, but perhaps, and it's a bit of a slippery slope argument, of maybe this universal legal system perhaps dividing up into separate legal systems for um, beliefs or just cultural traditions, for instance, like maybe um, a particular district um, adopts canon law, for instance, um, and then it sort of loses, I know, somewhat of its agreeability, and then you get this general idea of where's the arbitration, where's the um, higher arbiter in this? Can you see how that might tip the scales? 
No, because I mean the, the the underpinning of the state would be obviously the um, Islamic system that brings the state into in, into being, and then uh, from that basis, then you'll have the negotiated agreements with the uh, groups of people who don't follow the, the Islamic belief, so that we can so that they actually agree uh, by negotiation to to a particular way of coexistence. And of course, yeah, you can have multiple um, uh, factions. I mean, you know, many Christian factions only exist today because they were given a place to uh, to, to live um, outside of the, you know a very intolerant Europe at the time, who was basically persecuting uh, different factions. But just to, I think, answer that one, that one point you said, you say that the Western system isn't based on any particular, um, as you say, doctrine or dogma. No, but I mean the ECHR. ECHR. Tons of Western systems that are based on specifically, for example, Christian okay. ideologies, but. Sure. Well, um, I would I would actually contest that. I would say that deep in the in the bowels of uh, liberalism, which underpins the ideological underpinning of the ECHR, you have um, a, a concepts such as individualism, you know, which is a, a philosophical adoption, uh, you know, on 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 how to manage humans. Uh, you have e equality as identicality, you know, which is uh, which is a, a, an adoption. Not everyone believes that equality. In, in that interpretation of equality and so on, uh, you have the belief in moral agency that we have free will and we can somehow make choices. This is a this is a, uh, a me me metaphysical concept, you know. Um, actually, how are we even equal? In what way are we equal? Some are more intelligent than others. Some are stronger than others. Some have better immune system than others. Some have, you know, are more genetically fit than others. Uh, nature doesn't say we're equal. So where do we get this idea that we're equal from? Again, that's a relic from Christianity, which we've we've um, you know usefully borrowed oh, and are implementing. <laughs> actually, actually, many people would argue that uh, that the, the, the European law is based on Judeo-Christian ideology. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Obviously. Gotta give them credit too. Go get them credit too, and so on. <laughs> well, okay. If yeah. you don't mind, it, I, I'll move on to my second question then. Uh, the second question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, right. Save it for a bit later. I just yes. want to give up. I think I'm yeah. kind of hogging all the. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, actually, it deals with capital punishment, so maybe we should just deal with it now, if you don't mind. Uh, well, it's up to you. Jake? Up to you. I, blood on the floor. I promise I it's entertaining. I'm, well, I, I believe I'm. That man in the hoodie, I don't know your name, apologies. Uh, but I, I was just going to actually, I mean, avoiding the sort of topic of mm -hmm. killings in this case, and you're saying it's cultural, not religious, but um, in the case of apostasy, which is definitely religious, um, and you're saying that separate laws apply to separate religious groups, at what point uh, in apostasy in Judeo-Christian uh, Judeo or Islamic or Buddhist or you know, any religion, at what point does that sort of legal system then suddenly change for them? For, for apostates, okay, um, I, I think the whole conception of apostates is misunderstood within Islam. It's best translated as treason against the state. That is the best, that is the better translation. Um, I, would, I would refer to people to um, Surah 4, um, verse 88 in the Quran, if you want to make a note of that. And it discusses, it, what it says in that, in that Surah is that those people who basically want to change their religion, and uh, they, or they have changed their religion from Islam, and they don't want to fight against you know, the, the, the Muslims or attack them or, or so on, so their hearts are restrained from physically fighting you, uh, then, you know, leave them be. In fact, don't even tell them to come back to Islam because God willed that they would leave Islam. So it's, that's what it says. I'm not going to, obviously, I'm not, I don't like to make assertions without evidence. I know it might, people might find it hard because the media has told you something else. So I'm giving you references. So a four, um, verse 88, read it yourself. It is a law against treason, and this law only applies under an Islamic state because your treason has to be against the state. It can't be against anyone, you know, anyone, anyone I, else. I agree that it only applies under which Islamic law is actually implemented. My problem is the fact that it's implemented. What the law against treason is implemented? No, the law of, of death for apostasy. Is well, I mean, theoretically, I think uh, in America it's still outlawed treason, and in some places it could be killed. Uh, you could be killed for, for treason against the state. So doesn't um, make it right. Well, um, I don't think you have a basis to say it's wrong. That's, that's my point. Okay. Um, you have a question? Yeah, um, you say that it's fair to kill someone um, and make them stay in prison for the rest of their life, but wouldn't it be fairer and you know, more in favor of their right to life if you said it was up to them to decide whether they wanted to have the life sentence or be given the death penalty, and also especially if they have family, you know, and indeed children, it's incredibly unfair to the family to make them suffer in that way. Okay, um, so you, you ask, um, should, should the person who, uh, who executed someone, murdered somebody, uh, be given a choice whether they could spend life in a jail or be executed? I don't think they offered that choice to their victim. 
as to whether they should have continued life or not. So I don't think the choice is up to them. I think the choice is up to those who remain behind, who are aggrieved by that action, which is the family, the victim's family, and they can choose to forgive or not. Maybe the guy can make a plea, or the girl, girl can make a plea to the victim's family uh, as to whether, why he should be um, you know, forgiven or not, or what have you. But I don't think you should give criminals a choice about how they're punished. But no system does that. But, you, but you're, you're, you're arguing that they should be given the death penalty on the grounds that it's fairer. But then, I mean... No, it's more humane. Well, okay, but then wouldn't it be, you know, equally humane to give them the choice? I mean, you know, shouldn't they be able to decide what's humane? I mean, and what if they were wrongfully convicted? Yeah. Um, th that's why um, in capital punishments in Islam, the criteria for, for proof is so high that, um, you know, the, uh, that it's, it's kind of, uh, for most of these pri crimes, it's, it's hard, it's, you can't prosecute, it's not even a viable law to prosecute. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu even told, Mus uh, he commanded Muslims saying, find any excuse you can to let someone off of, of a capital punishment. Okay. Um, if I, I'd just like to um, open up the um, discussion just a bit more generally. Um, so, recently um, we've seen a lot of um, sensationalist and emotional headlines about certain pra religious practices or even traditional practices being um, uh, undermined or um, completely abolished due to offence of other um, religious groups. I mean, a, a lot of these are, to be frank, Daily Mail headlines. But, I mean, there's a few uh, choice examples like um, France's um, abolition of the birth, for instance. Um, Germany's um, bill, which um, initially planned to um, abolish um, religious-based um, circumcision, although that's now been um, uh, relaxed slightly to um, it being okay until the age of six, until um, then after that age it's going to a doctor. But um, my general question is, um, do you feel that states have a right to intervene in these religious practices if there's um, some, it causes any discomfort or um, particular offence to some citizens, for instance, do you think that's a right by the state? This is to the whole panel, sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll keep it short, but I, I don't think so. Um, the right to freedom of expression under the ECHR mm. and all international human rights um, instruments includes the right to be offensive. Um, there is However, as I said earlier, and as you all probably know, the right to manifest one's religious belief is not an absolute right. It can be limited in order to protect protect rights. Um, so it might be the rights the rights of children. Um, it might be the rights of of other people. It might be in the interests of public public order, etc. Um, but I think purely in the grounds that it's offensive to other citizens is is hugely problematic, particularly when we consider that human rights is particularly important. Human rights are particularly important for minorities and to protect against the majority, majority rule. Okay, um, another example um, would be um, Amnesty International, for instance, um, fighting against um, religious circumcisions, um, describing them as uh, male genital mutilation. Um, Rabbi, how would you um, like feel about that certain point, the fact that um, an international institution is coming at um, your sacred religious practices in such a um, quite a, a cold way. How would you propose that they be a bit more sensitive? Let's okay, say. I just um, mm. go going back to your comment about the, the German law, it, 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 and this, this connects with what you're asking me specifically. It's important to know that that law was a, a regional law, not a national law. It's only for the Cologne, Cologne region, not for the whole of Germany. And uh, it was overruled by, by Angela Merkel as, as, as a part of looking at the bigger picture, if you want. And I think it's essential, in answer to your question, that when you talk about human rights and you talk about understanding all the aspects of human rights, which uh, Elizabeth just pointed out, you look at everything, at all the aspects. There's the, the nine different categories of human rights, and uh, one's human rights is not uh, less or more important than another's. And it's essential that these organizations, including Amnesty International, look at the bigger picture. They look at the bigger context and, uh, and understand. You, you, you can't come and say circumcision sounds odd. I find circumcision to be extremely difficult to understand on a, on a, on a, on a 
scientific or psychological level, on a personal level, I, I hate blood. I, I, I hate watching, I, I, when a doctor gives me a shot, I find it extremely painful. I cringe, I hold on to the chair. I don't like blood. Um, for somebody to turn around and say, it seems odd, yeah, of course it seems odd, but you have to look at the bigger picture and say, you know, what's the context? 4,000 years of, of a practice which, uh, which is very important and an essential part of a, of a religious belief. Look at the bigger picture. And I think the, the chief rabbi in his uh, plea to Angela Merkel, which from what I understand was one of the biggest factors in, in, her, in her response, was that it, it doesn't come across that the court in Cologne were looking at the bigger picture at all. If they were familiar with the bigger picture, they would have either commented on certain aspects of the bigger picture or they wouldn't have come to their conclusion. And it's essential, if we want human rights to work, which I, I believe the Jewish community in the UK and in Europe and around the world wants it to work, it's essential that all aspects of human rights are taken into account. Everyone's human rights. It's my human right to be circumcised. I actually, have some, I spoke to a, a, a solicitor yesterday who has a strong interest in human rights. I said to him, if my parents had made the choice not to circumcise me until I'm 18, I said, don't circumcise me when I'm eight days old because it's, den it's a violation of my human rights. When I was 18, could I take them to the human rights court? Because when I'm 18, it's extremely more painful and extremely more difficult to undergo <laughs> circumcision. He paused and he said, that's a perfectly reasonable argument. You just have to hope that the judge in the case is not prejudiced <laughs> and is going to listen to the, both sides of the argument. Thankfully, my parents circumcised me when I was eight days old. But <laughs> on going on the basis then, if it's just done by tradition, you have 4,000 years, um, are you also in support of female genital mutilation that's done in tribal areas for many thousands? I've years? spoken to a girl who lived in Africa for three years. To make the comparison is, 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 is very, very dangerous. I'm not saying that uh, you're making the comparison in the no, context that um, many people is, do. Is the point of something that you said that because it's done by tradition for 4,000 years, so that should be taken into account? I, and I, this is done no, in tribal areas. What, what I said was that every aspect of the tradition has to be taken into account. You can't look in isolation at any specific aspect. As far as female mutilation, as I said, I've spoken to a girl who lived in, 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 a, in an area in Africa where this is practiced. And she, she's, a, she's a traditional Jew who says she would circumcise her boys no problem. And she sees what goes on over there. And she says the comparison in, is simply incomparable in, in every level. And it's important that Amnesty International and those organizations that are looking at these questions look at that honestly and say, are we just putting it into the same emotive, reactive bundle? Or are we looking at every single aspect of it and taking everything into account? I think there's also some other uh, kind of angle on, on the matter. Um, I mean, it's uh, you know, pe people believe that I said the, con the you know liberalism as ideology is is, uh, is defined by its tolerance, but by necessity it actually is intolerant, and it, and, it, and it, you know it's, it has to be by its, its creed because if it's not if something is not liberal, according to the liberal worldview, that's injustice, and then how can liberalism tolerate injustice? And hence, it has to then start to impose itself or deny um, other systems to exist because they're not liberal. So communism will be a natural enemy. Or, or during the McCarthy eras, this is this is how they they, they would you know they would limit it. Again, um, we see that the ECHR have accepted a lot of these um, intolerances in Europe um, under certain principles, which are also in the articles uh, of the of the convention, such as obviously the protection of public morals and what is necessary in a democracy. Well, a very ambiguous term. What is necessary in a democracy? You know, I suppose uh, you know, um, Hitler did what he thought was necessary in a, in a, in a Nazi democracy because you know, he was voted into power, the Nazis were voted into power. I, don't, I find that completely dubious. Um, we see, for example, that the minaret bans were upheld by the ECHR. Uh, we see that um, the banning of political groups, non-violent political groups like Rafa Party in Turkey and uh, Hizb al-Tahrir in Germany, I think, or, or they were banned from making public uh, you know, associations and things was upheld because they would, uh, these groups weren't liberal and so didn't deserve to be protected by liberalism because they were an existential threat. Their ideology, in, even though they're non-violent, is an existential threat and can't be protected. Um, one, uh, the, the, uh, a woman who wanted to go into, uh, a girl wanted to st learn in school and university with her hijab in Turkey um, was banned, prevented from doing so in Turkey and the ECHR upheld that ban saying that was necessary for the, you know, the, the, the democracy of Turkey. So these, these kind of things, I think, are, you know, is, is the, is kind of, there's an intolerance, uh, intolerance there. But 
Um, just regarding what you mentioned about parents and kids and, and how they, you know, how that kind of works. This, this is very interesting because um, kids obviously haven't reached the age of maturity, and so according to you know most political philosophies in the world, you know they they can't make free choices for themselves. So then, who makes free choices on their behalf for their betterment? It's their parents. So the parent might believe, according to their own conception of what is good, which liberalism says it, it supposedly doesn't, doesn't get involved with people's conceptions of good, that the parent says, right, I want my kid to be, uh, to be a Jew or to be a Muslim or to whatever, and they will have to undergo circumcision. Okay. But then um, that's all fine until, you know, until liberalism says, wait a second, but maybe later on if the kid doesn't want to be, then you've kind of denied their free choice. So according to the liberal model of what, uh, of what, is, um, of what is freedom, we're gonna, at some point they're going to start intervening in how p- parents raise their children. Maybe one day even saying that teaching your kid a religion is, is taking away their freedom, their freedom of conscience and so on. So it, 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 and some, some atheists have argued this. As well, so I'm saying, where's it? Where's it stop? This is the this is a kind of a scope creep of of liberalism into people's lives, micromanaging the people, how they interact, and so on and so forth. And I think it's quite dangerous. So just something to bear in mind. Um, just with regard to that point, um, where do you stand on the issue that if both parents are consenting to a ritual circumcision or any sort of medical procedure, then the procedure is considered perfectly legitimate and the practice is legal. But it is only when one parent agrees and one parent disagrees that either a court will intervene or there is any intervention at all. Where do you stand on the idea that, from a human rights aspect, uh, let's just say a circumcision can amount to, uh, per se, trespass, and it could be actionable. Where do you draw the line that the rights of the individual parents should be what is discussed, and the rights of the child are somewhat set aside only because the parents disagree? Why is it that the child's rights are completely ignored when the parents are in agreement? but it's only their rights considered when the parents have a disagreement or they... That's based on an assumption that the child's rights are, are, are being denied. All you need to do is ask, 19, ask anyone who's been circumcised whether they feel that their rights have been denied. I have absolutely no problem with, a ch- with an adult who was circumcised when they were eight days old taking their parents to a human court, a rights court and winning, as far as I'm concerned. But the, other, but the rest, the, the, the majority who are quite happy being circumcised would, as I said earlier, have the right to do the reverse if they weren't circumcised. And, and, and I think that it's vital that we recognize the importance of the Human Rights Act and the Equality Act and all of these things that enable every minority and every majority to be able to go about their lives and do what they believe in and what they think is important. All of these you know, I, I, it's very interesting. For me, this has been fascinating. I, I don't study law, and uh, looking into this whole thing the last couple of days and doing the research and preparation for this discussion has been really interesting for me. And I'm very grateful to be able to live in Europe and in the UK. And I know that the, for, for the Jewish community have been advocating for the needs of their community for well over 2,000 years. We've been living. In, un, under the rule of other countries for well over 2,000 years, a Hebrew word, Shtadlanim, which means advocates within the Jewish community who communicate with the leaders or the state or whoever it is, has been going on for a very, very long time and very successfully all over the world, sometimes not so successfully to our detriment, sadly. But by and large, and certainly today, I think we're very grateful and we're very lucky. And I would say that we're able to communicate our message on a national level, on an international level, and I think that's a great thing. And can, I, can, I just, can I just, just to clarify, I mean, I think one of the reasons is the way human rights law operates. Um, normally we, we think of human rights cases as being brought against the state. So cases are brought to the European Court of Human Rights against the UK. Um, under the Human Rights Act, there's an action for judicial review against public authorities if they breach an individual's rights. And human rights only come into play in cases between private individuals or in criminal cases, etc. Um, what's the cases are ready in court. So I guess in terms of legal, it, it only becomes an issue when someone brings a case for trespass against the person or um, because they're not bringing a case against their parents. It's, it's the state. Okay, well, following on from that then, um, you said you would be happy for anyone who ended up seeing that their reli- ritual circumcision was wrong to bring a case and winning. What would you but the case would have to be against the UK. Uh, of course, yeah. but what would you say to people whose opinions change? For example, if someone has had a ritual circumcision at eight 
uh, eight days old, and they have lived for 30 years, completely fine with the decision. It may never have never even crossed their mind. But then they start to read into political and social philosophy, and they then decide, well, actually, this is wrong. I know we have a statute of limitations to try and deal with this aspect, but there's this whole idea of data knowledge as to when they see this idea as wrong. Are you saying that there should be an idea of accession to the capricious nature of people as to because someone one day decides that what has been done to them is wrong, their rights should still be upheld 30, 50, however many years later. Is it just as important even if the event is so long ago? That's to anybody who wishes. <laughs> no. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, a judge would have to judge that. I don't know, we need to hear the professional legal opinion. Um, Absolutely. If somebody turns around at the age of 70 and says, I feel my human rights have been denied, the court would have to listen. I don't know what, what the court would rule is, 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 uh, is, is for the legal profession. Well, they to have determine. to have a cause of action to bring a case in domestic courts. And mostly there's time limitations yeah. in terms of when cases can be brought. Somebody looked into this for their moot. Who was it? <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so you probably know as much as I do about it. I'll give um, you the scenario he was trying to play out. Like, let's say somebody's raised as a practicing conservative or, uh, I guess, orthodox Jew, and at the age of, uh, let's say, 16, 17, they decide, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking that there's no God now, I'm an atheist. They become an adult. Now they're an adult, so they can bring cases on their own. So they say, from that date of knowledge that they find out, oh, I no longer believe in this religion, I'm not going to regrow back my foreskin. I don't even know if there's plastic surgeons that'll even touch that with a ten-foot pole. But speaking of, but anyway, um, so if they bring a case against their parents saying they made a decision against my autonomy to have a part of me removed that I will never get back, I don't believe what they believe. From I guess a Jewish perspective, was a harm caused to that person, or From was or were the parents human, acting in the best human interest? Rights perspective. From both. From a human rights perspective, we know it's it, if you do something to someone that was not a necessary to be done and in no way in their best interest, the and it caused them harm. The, the question is, as uh, uh, to me, what I wh wh whether I would embrace the human rights courts' view of it, and they're enabling this individual to present their case. Hmm. And my answer is absolutely. And I would say to any parent who's considering circumcising their child, that you have a responsibility to teach your child that your child should grow up understanding and appreciating why you did that to them. Otherwise, you should really question whether you're doing the right thing or not. Mm -hmm. Not just because you might end up in a human rights court okay. with a big bill, yeah. but because is it right to circumcise your child and then not give your child any background knowledge or appreciation of why you've done that? What if they have done their best, though, and the child just chooses not to believe? The, 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 they'll have to get some very good lawyers, and I would be very <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, the I, danger is... Right? I'm very comfortable no. living in the West. No, I, I really uh, what I mean know. is the danger is if a court says, yes, you know what, the parents acted wrong. It's setting a precedent saying that maybe because they acted in the name of Judaism, that acting like that in the name of Judaism is wrong. But is the court likely to say yes when you looked into it? Um, I mean, it well, it depends on the court. Cologne obviously did, but I mean, not, I'm pretty sure not every court would. But as, for example, Abdullah was saying, things change in liberalism. Our concept of these things might change in 10, 15 years. And what I'm trying to ask the rabbi is, where would Judaism stand if you once again see, for example, the ECHR making a monumentous decision saying circumcisions are wrong? And, and this can be to both of you because I know in Islam you circumcise as well, correct? Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, at that point, how much of an affront is that to, to religion as opposed to an individual's rights to not have their body trespassed against? Well, uh, you raise a great, a great question. I absolutely love it because it, it brings another, another example. Um, what is... What, who defines what was wrong with that? If, you, if, a, if a, a child grows up, becomes adult, becomes an atheist, falls out with their parents, hates their parents, wants to get back at their parents, and go to, say, I'm going to take you to the court, uh, uh, you know, you denied my, my right to uh, whatever, the court would have to decide what is, what is the conception of a good life, or a conception of, a, of, a, of human nature, or a conception of, of, of uh, what a human should be, and then make a judgment saying, well, you've gone against this model. And then the, court, then the court and the state cease to become neutral. I don't think they're neutral anyway. But they become even, even less neutral about um, all these philosophical questions and they start in getting themselves involved. I think that, and, and besides, as to contradicting a child's autonomy, I, I know that's, that's a kind of obviously a, a liberal philosophical point of view, um, the child's autonomy is, is gone against every single day by their parents. 
you know, not be not being allowed to eat what they want, not be allowed to dress what they want. Maybe they want to, they don't want to go to school. Maybe they want homeschooling, or maybe they don't want homeschooling. They want to go to school. Maybe they don't like to eat the food that's been made by by the mum. Want to have some other kind of food, whatever. Right? Every day the child's autonomy is being contradicted by the parents but and so on. But not in a non-reversible way, though. Right, I'm going to have to cut you off. Um, Sorry, man go ahead. Who's been waiting. I've, I've, I was just going to ask what medical evidence you have to support your claim, which is that an eight-day-year-old baby feels somehow less pain than an eighteen-year-old person, apart from the fact that they can say no. I'm sitting here. <laughs> and, I've and I've spoken to adults who have been circumcised. I have no recollection of my circumcision whatsoever. I couldn't walk for about 18 months afterwards, but that was with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, actually, you could even argue that the, the medical benefit, there are medical benefits with circumcision. Obviously, you know, it pre prevents cancer. Uh, you're less what? susceptible. <laughs> it helps prevent penile cancer. It helps prevent penile cancer. Yes, yes. By the way, by the way, I I wasn't I was I was I was true. Okay, but I wasn't going to go down this route. But all you need to do, you might argue that the NHS is biased. You're very welcome to do so. But if you do, if you look on the NHS website under circumcision and see what they write, um, if you're prepared to look at it honestly, it seems to be implying that they are in support of circumcision. For medical reasons, yeah, as I, STDs I, I, as well. I don't support it helps it, impede, it, uh, impede STDs, communicable, communicable STDs. I mean, yes, it's not an absolute, obviously, you know, shield or barrier against all those things, but <laughs> people have, you know, wish it was. But uh, you know, uh, there, you know, there is, you know, empirical evidence as to lower rates, and that's it. This is actually not really that, that disputed amongst them in the medical profession. I didn't even know there was any dispute on it until that gentleman said it was, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, deferring to those who, uh, I don't know if you're, if you're a scientist, but deferring to the scientists this is what they say. So, okay, that's not why I believe, you know, people should be allowed to do circumcision. I don't believe, I don't advocate, that's not my basis. I'm just saying it's just an interesting kind of anecdote anyway. I, I mean, I think what is interesting is the fact that the reason we're having this debate is linked to the point you made about the trend in the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, which is to find that there hasn't been a violation of the right to manifest freedom of religion. Um, because they've deferred to the state's kind of margin of appreciation in relation to the ban of minarets and the wearing of the headscarf. And, um, and actually it is quite conceivable that this is an issue that the European Court of Human Rights will look at and decide actually there is a human rights issue here. Um, and that's, I think that's really interesting because we wouldn't have had this debate. Six, seven I would uh, point out just quickly as well, that, though, that the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, Article 24.3, if uh, you're interested, does state, states parties shall take effective and appropriate measures with a view to abolishing traditional practices prejudicial to the health of the children, which could possibly, obviously, I mean... We'd have to case, argue that it's prejudicial. Well, in the case, in the, in the, in the, in the German course, uh, the boy bled out, which is why he had to go to a hospital. I would say that was very prejudicial to his health at that time. Well, that's not related to circumcision per se. That's... A, uh, that's well, if you have a bad doctor with bad medical practices, I mean, is that the fault of the, of the medical practice or the fault of the doctor who, who made a mistake or, or was uh, incompetent? I think mean, that, that, that doesn't, doesn't really hold water. But just what you're saying about um, the UN Charter from Rights to the Child, does it not also state that it is a parent's right to decide the religious upbringing for their child? If it is then a necessity of, a re of that religion that the child then be circumcised, how do you deal with the clashing of those two <coughs> apparently equally important rights? Well, it's again, you, you have a similar problem, though, in um, the European Convention of Human Rights, so that if uh, you have a protection of freedom of uh, expression, freedom of thought and what have you, but that defers to um, uh, the rights of things not to be persecuted, not to be discriminated against, uh, and, you know, their rights not to be uh, uh, attacked by other people. You know, there, there are clashes within... Uh, the rights, and I guess it's going to be, have to be up to the courts to decide which one of those takes precedence. But I mean, I guess violence against the person would, I think, be a right that but, well, takes precedence case, over a right to. Taking the religious element out of it, if a circumcision was done without permission, it would, especially in English criminal law, account to a wounding under hmm. Section 20 of the Offence Against the Person Act. So. That's clearly something that is causing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> clearly, that is something that is causing a distinct, some would say, harm to the child. So, if a secular child, as I said earlier, there's, there's certain things that I'm still learning. This has been a great learning curve for me. If a secular couple in the UK circumcise their child. 
because of what the perceived medical benefits. They looked at the NHS website and they said, circumcision is the way to go. It will save our child all sorts of potential complications further down the road. How, how would that play out in human rights court? Well, that, well, from my reading anyway, would be consent to a standard medical procedure and would therefore be considered a legitimate process. Or if it was medically necessary, for example, if the foreskin was too well, tight. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about if there was a complication. If I'm, there was I'm a talking about from a theoretical standpoint, a circumcision is a procedure that can amount to either criminal proceedings or it is something that some people can argue causes a degree of harm, be it physical or even sometimes psychological later on in life. It is just an idea of if that is something that can, by definition, cause a degree of harm, then clearly it's a violation of the right of the child under the UN Charter. But if it's also correct in saying that it is the right of the parent to pick the religious upbringing of that child, and it's a necessity of their religious belief <coughs> to have your child circumcised, we surely have a conflict of interests in the sense that we have to decide whose autonomy is more important, but whose religious ideology should be upheld, or whose individual autonomy should be upheld. But I mean, human rights is all about balancing of rights. I mean, the freedom of expression, privacy cases involving the media. You know, two parties have rights. How do you balance them? Um, and the answer is, none of these rights are absolute rights. Um, even, but we do know, I mean, for example, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child refers to, if I remember correctly, it doesn't use the term parental rights. It's referring to... Um, it recognises the kind of role that parents play in relation to providing guidance in relation to um, certain certain issues. Um, and so there's always, that's about, well, human rights is all about competing rights. You know, nearly every human rights decision involves competing rights and the courts have to decide which right prevails. Um, yeah, well, and how I the rights should be interpreted and applied in a particular situation. Well, as I said, I mean, um, this is where the state gets involved in people's conceptions of good. Or what is the mm. what is the what what is the basis for um, determining whether something is good or bad? Again, you know, the state or liberalism itself is not actually partial. It's not actually neutral. It just you know portrays itself as such, but it's not. Um, generally speaking, I think the more preeminent f philosophy is sec secular humanism in the West. It has the top dog status of determining what is right and wrong. All other philosophical traditions don't have that same top dog status and have to now defer to its, um, you know, kind of totalitarian philosophy uh, of rule in that sense. I'm sure but, you look a bit distressed. Yeah, yeah uh, 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 I'm just wondering on uh, what basis you're making that claim. Considering well, it's particularly in this country where we still have bishops in the House of Lords and we still have the head of state as the head of the church. What basis is secular humanism? I, well, I don't know when the last time the Queen issued a fatwa, but uh, <laughs> she might have. Uh, but but okay, just, just give a good example. So let's take more like um, you know you said about you know, parents. Um, you know parents obviously should be prohibited from uh, if it's part of a tradition to kind of obviously you know harm their child or mutilate their child or so on and so forth. Well, I think that means that we should ban McDonald's and taking your kids to McDonald's because it's actually bad for the health of the child to take them to McDonald's or all these sugary drinks and sugars and so on causing attention deficit disorders. And and all such problems. Um, what about piercings, ear piercings for, for girls as well? That's also um, harming the person. You could say, you know, it's harming their, you know, kind of physical, their vestigial attribute of skins and things like that. Obviously, the foreskin is vestigial. It's not, it's not part of the, obviously, some kind of, it's not linked into any sensory aspects of the, of the child's pleasure, you know, um, pleasure, you know, zones. I don't so, argue with that, actually. Yeah, so, <laughs> all right, that's fine. Well, all right, but, but I mean, um, the, the, the question really here in the West is more about choice. So you can, you can have um, plastic surgery. Right, you can have was it you can have uh, was it uh, labioplasties, labioplasties, which is pretty much dealing, you know, filling with someone's genitals, and I'm not referring to the fun sense of that term. Um, so, you know, but but these things in itself are not actually the source of uh, are not to be condemned intrinsically in the West, right? It's always about the choice. That's the only question. Is it? Did you choose it? Did you not choose it? That's the real question. Not if you actually mutilate. I could cut my my arm off if I wanted to in the West. 
and they wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be in, locked in, in, in jail. I could even tell my friend to cut my arm off and, give, and make consent for this, and my, my friend wouldn't be jailed for that. So really, it's not the actual uh, kind of new flat, flat self-flagellation or mutilation Barbara. aspect. It's the, uh, it's the, uh, it's the uh, you you know, autonomy you aspect. You wouldn't end up in jail, but you might end up in a mental hospital. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably. At this point, you might end up in jail. You would end up in it's jail. illegal to actually behave in any kind of manner. You can't consent to a grievous bodily harm. If, if you ask your friend to cut your arm off, you're both probably going to be jailed. Well, you'll, well, you'll go to an insane asylum. Hold <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I understand what you're saying, that um, it's quite hard to draw the line. Um, but, I mean, I think, firstly, we can be a bit more pragmatic than that. And I think some things are a bit more transient than others. But I was going to ask, um, do you really think perhaps circumcising a child at a young age, um, maybe may even teaching them why they've been circumcised, but at the same time, teaching them about the religion and then accepting if they want to make a uh, core of human rights claim at the age of 18. Do you really think that's the same as leaving them completely uncircumcised and sort of, um, I don't want to say indoctrinated, but spoken to from a very young age about religion and then, you know, allowing them to decide? I mean, obviously people are affected by the environment, but even just teaching them why they've been circumcised that doesn't give them complete free will because no doubt a pa any parent who's gone and wanted to do that will, you know, impose their own views and subsequently the child's autonomy. Is that, you know, is that real autonomy? Well, that's what I remember what I said um, earlier on, which is that what I'm, uh, what I kind of almost, you know, m might see coming around the corner is that the state gets involved in how parents would raise their children and saying you can't impose it on them or teach them any particular prejudice or bias except state sanctioned bias and prejudice which reminds me of certain um, you know 20th century states which did the same thing and do we really want to go down that road you know is that is that the future for liberalism you know uh, I mean liberalism the word just becomes ironic uh, and after after a while um, I, I think it's just we have to do some soul searching I think with, with regards to how we actually live as human beings and uh, the, the more fundamental, I think we, we check our more fundamental you know, kind of assumptions about how to organize human beings rather than just say, right, well, we have liberalism, okay, it's not properly working, but let's just see how we can, uh, you know, get the best out of a bad system. Whereas, uh, why not just question, maybe there's not a way of life to, to, to look at, uh, not a different political philosophy to, to look at, because we, these are fundamental problems and contradictions occurring, and people are going to jail over this, people are being denied uh, you know what they see is their conscience, following their, their conscience, and I think these things, you know, should should kind of uh, be taken very seriously. And I think we should start questioning rather the root of of of, our, of what we hold to be secure, checking our own dogmas, and seeing if those dogmas really hold up to, to intellectual scrutiny. I think that's the beauty. Sorry, I, I think that's the beauty of liberalism, though, is that you can question the authority. You can. Uh, question the rules you know it's constantly changing there's no this is it and this is going to be it forever you know. can you challenge liberalism itself in the west well yeah are you not now no, I mean, uh, um, okay, yeah. all right, then tell that to, the, tell that to Rafah Party, tell that to, to the group Hezbo Dahrir, who were banned because of their, they hold values which were fundamentally ad, uh, against secularism or in, 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 viewed as inimicable to democracy, they were banned. So they weren't like given that, toler they weren't given that, to that toleration. Um, sure, I mean, most societies will tolerate, um, you know, kind of fringe elements until these fringe elements become more significant and more, uh, or, 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 like, like, for example, you know, prior to the McCarthy era, no one really obviously kind of went after communists. But during the Soviet Union and uh, when actually communism was actually viewed as a real existential threat, then they started to uh, kind of persecute and oppress communists. And, and America is actually meant to be more free a country than, than England, and they were, doing that, they were doing that in America. So all I'm saying is that, um, you know, the, well, liberalism is not is not actually is not actually tolerant. Um, the Muslim yeah, the Muslim the Muslim community. Tolerant. I mean, look at what David Cameron said from Munich about you know muscular liberal the need now for muscular liberalism, and uh, he talked about a whole bunch of ways and means to start tackling um, you know Muslim extremism, i.e. Uh, a, a holistic Islam, because Islam has a political aspect to it. Uh, the, obviously, the, the Jewish law has a political aspect to it, but that's not, not really applied anymore uh, to any, any great degree, I think, in, in, a, in a state level anyway. Um, you know, most religions actually had a political aspect to them in the past, right? It's, it's, it's anachronistic to think that uh, religion, only maybe Islam does, but everyone else doesn't, or uh, anyone who believes that religion and politics is, is the same is an extremist. No, I mean, you know, that's just what it always has been in, amongst humanity. But that's what could I, could, could, I just, could I just also yeah, come in with that, that? At the end of the day, I think it's essential that you look at the, 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 the people who have been circumcised and you ask them this question. The, uh, as was mentioned, the Cologne ruling was based on m people who didn't 
have any interest in circumcision and were concerned about the medical, uh, the medical issues of, of a child who, who, who had a medical problem as a result, challenging it. We're not talking about Jew, a, a mass number of Jews who were circumcised or, or individuals who were circumcised who are now going to human rights court saying this should be abolished. You're talking about people who don't recognize, were not circumcised, and have a massive problem with it. I, as far as I'm concerned, those who are circumcised have, should have the equal right to argue their case in the Human Rights Court. Okay. Um, I'm just going to do a few quick questions. Um, Tom. Um, hi. Well, first off, um, I'd like to apologize for the volume of my incredulity. I realize that may have come across as a bit rude. But um, secondly, this quest, this, uh, these metaphysical ideas that you say underlie, underlie Sharia, the um, anti-individualistic, socially determined, um, skepticism about free will. Uh, if you have all those elements, how then can you have a conception of blame and responsibility? I think you misunderstood me. Um, I, I'm all for um, you know, moral agency, and I don't believe in, that, in, in absolute non-individualism or com communalism or something. I believe that humans are kind of somewhere in between being you know, individuals and society. Uh, I think that we are social an animals, social creatures. We have mirror neurons in our, mind, in our, in our brains, which mean that we, kind of, we have a, a propensity to kind of imitate other human beings around us. Is, we, were, we were made, so to speak, to be kind of plugged into the, to human society. Basically, so um, to believe that in this kind of um, you know pre-social position, humans were these kind of you know disembodied individuals, which now come into society. You have to protect this metaphysical idea of this individual. It doesn't exist. It's, it never has existed, and has led to you know a, I think a malformation of a political idea in philosophy, and that's caused lots of problems. Because as, as and I didn't just realize this. You know, libertarianism you know kind of morphed into social liberalism now when they realize that people don't get along if you just leave them by themselves, just guarantee their rights not to, for the state not to interfere. You have to start micromanaging people to stop them hating each other, stop the mass prejudices and discriminations and, or the, or, and social oppression rather than just state oppression. So the, the fl liberal philosophers themselves realized that there was problems with these, these philosophies, not just me, me saying it. But I, I, I think there's one thing I did say. I, I made an assertion. I'm, well, okay, I, I've, I've backed up with a few evidences from contemporary um, you know, uh, uh, you know, circumstances. But when I mentioned that liberal, uh, liberalism is naturally intolerant uh, to other political ideologies, um, this is not just a, a modern phenomenon or a few bad eggs. Uh, this is, you know, liberal philosophers have been saying this for a long time. So, we, you know, like John Milton railed against Catholics, saying that you shouldn't tolerate Catholics. And this, this guy who wrote his, uh, if, I, if I can pronounce it properly, uh, Areopagitica. Um, you know, which was meant to be a, a great discourse on freedom and, you know, and uh, freedom of conscience, but he was not tolerant to, to Catholics, saying that they were an existential threat, because Catholicism was viewed as a political force in Europe. Um, uh, John Locke said that atheists and Mohammedans shouldn't be tolerated, because then they are, they are also an existential threat to um, you know, the, kind of the, the, the liberal paradigm. And as, again, as I said, you know, uh, David Cameron in his Munich speech, let me you know, read out one passage. He goes, a passively tolerant society says to its citizens, as long as you obey the law, we will leave you alone. I wish that was the case. However, he continues, it stands neutral between different values, but a genuinely liberal country does much more. Unfortunately, it's that much more which I uh, find rather threatening. Sorry, could I just backtrack a bit? So you do believe in free will then? Yeah, more agency, yeah. Uh, how can you have free will without an entity to manifest that free will, an individual entity to manifest that free will? Um, well, individual is that what we believe that is, is, is the soul, really, in terms of making choice. The choice resides within the soul. But it's, think of it more in analogy as you, you, the human body is made up of a number of cells. Each of these cells you know, it has its own power source, and it, and it, does, its, it does its own, own actions, according to genetic code, of course. There are, uh, generally speaking, they work within, obviously, a bigger framework, according to this genetic code, where they all kind of uh, cooperate, <coughs> so that the greater organism obviously functions. But you do have cells that want to do their own thing, and we have a name for these cells, and they're called cancer. You see? So, the Islam views human society as like a human body, basically. There are, you know, there's aspects of you which are individual and aspects of you which are social. If you keep whatever you're, you're sinning to yourself and you, into your privacy room home, the political aspects of Sharia won't, won't have any concerns with you. It's between you and God, and that's where your moral agency between you and God will be accounted. Between you and your soul, that 
is. Yeah, yeah, but what, 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 what between yeah. you and God? Yeah. But okay, but in terms of the, your, what your public actions, they actually <coughs> affect others and they impinge on others. So if I if I make life more difficult for someone else by giving them temptations, by depriving them of economic resources due to concentration of wealth, a whole number of aspects I could impinge on society without directly physically hurting people then this is where the Sharia will, will, will step in and um, as, uh, kind of guarantee people's uh, natural rights according to the Islamic conception of what the natural rights are. Now, obviously, Islam is not neutral on the aspect of what is, what is deserved by human beings. Uh, and, but, any, but any political system to be viable can't be neutral. So I don't mind. You know what? I don't actually mind that liberalism is partial and biased on these matters. I just wish it was honest about it. I'd accept that. If they say, look, we're banning burqas, we're banning hijabs, we're banning minarets, uh, because, you know, this is our system, and you don't like it, that's tough. Say, all right, fine, at least you're honest about that. But they say, no, no, we're neutral and free. But you can't do this, 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 and that, and that, and that, and that, according to what, because we don't like it. Well, I don't like that kind of, you know, hypocrisy. That's what I'm really complaining about. Sorry, you have a question? Oh, two. Oh, no, no. Okay. Yeah, just firstly, I, I, I didn't think you'd totally clarify the whole apostasy issue earlier, mm. because um, obviously there is this current problem with Christian minorities, places such as like Northern Nigeria and Pakistan who are getting killed for exercising their faith and also Muslims who are converting to Christianity. And um, you talked about, you mentioned Surah Al Muhammad, talks about how, um, you know, we, we should let them go, but this is hardly being implemented anywhere. Are you, is this just, are they just wrongly interpreting this or are they actually just adhering to what's always been the case in a lot of Islamic societies where, where other religious minorities are just being oppressed or suppressed. And secondly, just to Dr. Craig, what's your personal opinion on how far the state should get themselves involved in private religious affairs? Okay, well, I'll just answer the first question. Sorry for ho hogging the, hogging the, the table on this. Um, Boko Haram are more reaction to um, a kind of, you know, a, a, a post-colonial phenomenon. You know, they were angry actually initially about um, you know Western education and secularism being imposed upon uh, you know Muslims in Nigeria, and there's also problems between North South divide the South, the richer South, um, you know, the, which are mainly Christian. Uh, during colonial era, they were more favoured by the Br British. Obviously, favoured those who have followed their, their well, their co-religionists. They favoured more than obviously all the natives or native religions, and so there's all this resentment there. There's a lot of this is post-colonial. It has nothing to do with Islam. In fact, amongst amongst Muslim the Muslim communities, Boko Haram are viewed as um, heretics who attack Muslim communities and impose. Um, uh, it's not even an Islamic interpretation. They just impose uh, they, this general anti-Western fanaticism. Uh, so, so fanatically they are anti-West that they'll take anything they think is Western, irrespective of whether Islam says we, we should or shouldn't or anything like that. In terms of, in terms of Pakistan, um, uh, Pakistan is, I would say, is close to a failed state than anything else. You have vigilantism, you have uh, prejudice on, um, leading to people being killed, attacked, Muslims being killed and attacked by other Muslims, everyone's being killed and attacked. And just to highlight, oh, but there are Christians being killed and attacked too. To, uh, in Pakistan, it, it, you can't really cite that. Uh, Islamic Sharia is not really being applied anywhere in the, in the, in the world. Um, so so the, the only... The only the Sharia that you are holding is theoretically... It was never. It was never. It was never theoretical in the past. It was practical. The you know, the, the Ottoman, you know, caliphates the, the, and the, the previous caliphates. Well, in Islam, the, the, the Islamic state is a caliphate. This, you know, if, if you don't see a state that's a caliphate, that's not an Islamic state. It has no Islamic authority. The reason why a lot of these states are very oppressive to their people is because they lack relig uh, any religious authority. So what they try to do is they try to actually either you know cook. Even in Iran. Even. Sorry. All right. Do you move on to your second question? Um, yeah. Well, thank you. Do you want to say your question again? Yeah. <laughs> I've got my answer, but I just wanted to. We've got to first point of how far should the state, under the sort of current ECHR framework, implant itself into religious people's affairs, or such a circumcision, or in your view? I mean, I'm going to give a very general answer. Um, I think the right to religious freedom is a very important right. Um, because of its just the importance that religion holds in terms of in terms of people's um, ways of life and ways of thinking, and um, and I think that the right to freedom of religion does include the right to change one's religion. Um, and my kind of own view is that any restrictions on the right to manifest one's religious belief should be um, need to be clearly justified justified 
um, and that we need to question any attempts to interfere with religious freedom. Um, and yet, sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes it is necessary. I think it's a human rights story in a democratic society. Um, but I don't agree with the answers to that question that have been given by the European Court of Human Rights, for example. Um, I don't think the European Court of Human Rights is doing enough to uphold religious freedom. Um, so it's quite a general question, but I, th I think we should be very cautious about allowing the state to intervene too much. On that point, then, with particularly with the, um, the the case in the European Court, does that include the two in which they were discriminating against uh, homosexual, homosexual couples? Um, can you just clarify who the they is that you're talking oh, about? Oh well, um, it so was you, the, so you're, you're the, the relate case where yeah, no, no, no the uh, cases, uh, but which who are the they that you're saying are discriminating against homosexual couples? Oh, the um, the people that refused to uh, whoever. Okay, is so you're saying that the individuals who brought yeah. the case, arguing that their right to freedom of religion had been restricted, yes. were discriminating on the grounds of sexual orientation. Yes. Okay. Um, and what was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> does, does, you, you said you disagreed with the judgments in those cases. You I didn't know. I didn't say those cases. I said religious freedom cases generally. Oh, oh sorry. I, I thought you said. I thought um, you said those. I thought you were referring to the four cases that had just been. I mean, I did. I did on. disagree with. Um, the judgment in relation to the registrar who okay, yes. um, where the council introduced well when the civil partnerships act was, was passed um, this is the registrar who was required then to perform civil partnerships she um, ceremonies she argued that was contrary to her religious beliefs mm -hmm. Um, and also I think that she had been discriminated against on the grounds of her religious belief because she faced a sanction for so doing. Um, I do, but the European Court of Human Rights held that her rights hadn't been... You'll have to check, check, keep checking, I'm okay. getting it right. <laughs> the European Court of Human Rights held that her rights hadn't been violated. Um, and I, I, I didn't agree with that particular aspect of okay. the judgment, but I did agree in relation to the relate councillor who... Um, knew when he started undergoing training to do the psychosexual therapy that um, that his clients or the potential clients might include gay couples um, and so I, I think there is a difference in those two cases um, okay. and I think the European Court of Human Rights got it wrong in relation to Ms Liddell um, but I think it got it right in relation to the other. Do you not think that the work and, and I appreciate that the law changed after she had the job and so she was working in that job for uh, a while but do you not think that working for the state specifically that she should be required to oblige by those laws? No because I think that it, her beliefs could have been accommodated and I think I think this idea of reasonable accommodation of religious beliefs in the workplace is, is appropriate um, but that's that's because I hold very, I, I think the right to religious freedom mm. is, is important. Yeah. Um, and I think it's being it's being gradually undermined. Um, but I also think the right to equality is important. And yeah. I and I do um, arbitrate. You know, if it hadn't been possible to accommodate that, and people were actually going to be turned away um, and be told, "Sorry, you can't have a civil partnership ceremony here," I would say, "Yeah, that yeah. that's not right." Um, and the local authority clearly has a duty to provide yeah. that. So. Can I come back to the Sharia the, the, the Sharia law thing. I, I'm sure people are familiar that there are Jewish courts in the UK. And, and you never hear the question, why Jewish courts? So I just want to, cl cl to, to, to clarify that, uh, I mean, it's been fascinating hearing uh, how, the, how the, the Sharia law is being proposed to be accepted. I know there was just, uh, I just saw on the, last night and then there's something about uh, the state of Florida rejecting Sharia law and it just going past. Um, in the UK, I'm sure it's uh, similar elsewhere in Europe and in the US, the Jewish courts operate under the Arbitration Act, and that's the only um, jurisdiction that they have. So, I mean, I don't know how familiar everyone is with the, the Arbitration Act, but uh, it's either arbitration or, or mediation, and they have to follow all the criteria with, with the contra uh, contracts and uh, mutual consent from both sides, etc., etc. And as far as I'm concerned, if Sharia law wanted to have such a setup of arbitration law, I'd, uh, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Sure. Um, kind of just to kind of throw a little spare in the works, sorry. Um, as, I, as I do, it's, it's, what, it's what I was invited for today. Um, <laughs> um, okay, concerning the, that 
there was a, there was a, there was a Christian, I was a Christian individual who uh, didn't want to counsel um, what's called a gay couple because it went against their conscience. But see, here's here's the thing. Um, if you, if you know, we we have a right to the right to earn our livelihood. So. If you now saying that, okay, well, we're going to fire these people because they're acting according to their conscience, uh, you're denying them the right, right, right to livelihood. Um, I think John Stuart Mill said that it's not just locking people up, which is a, a, one form of oppression, also denying them a form of the, their right to livelihood or social reprobation are all, all, all kinds of facets of, of oppression and so on. So a person should be allowed to, ha to act, their, you know, kind of use their, their, their conscience in the matter. Now, you could argue, now, the counter-argument is, if an institution is, let's say, a state-based institution, it should be neutral, and so there is, should be some kind of form of, of compulsion in this matter. You, ha you, should, you, should, um, you know, shouldn't discriminate. Well, firstly, um, the state is, it represents the people, and, all the, and that person who was fired from their job is one of the people and pays taxes and deserves the right of representation. Um, you know, I don't want to quote Thomas Jefferson, but he says, "What's the effect of uh, that? Uh, you know, to, you know, to compel anyone to pay money uh, and not and basically uh, and not uh, you know rep be re represent their opinions in government is basically a, a sinful and tyrannical system, basically." So, um, if a person in working in the NHS, uh, you know, refuses to perform, uh, you know, some kind of a procedure on, let's say, for example, on, on a transsexual, thinking that's, that's against their conscience, or, or they refuse to join the army and go to war in Iraq because their conscience is conject, uh, objector, which I think there is some kind of remit for that. Although I think there's um, only if you're against war, uh, you know, not rather against a particular war, uh, you should be given the right to act according to your your conscience. Uh, there is no mandatory uh, compulsion in any of these matters. And I think in the old form of liberalism or libertarianism, you know, it was all about just permitted actions. People were permitted their actions and so on. But in this kind of new social liberalism or lib you know, libertarianism 2.0, whatever you want to call it, um, the, it's now it's become just permitted. It's, it's, become, it's not it ceased to become permitted actions and now become compelled entitlements where now you are, you are compelled to act against your conscience. Otherwise, you are viewed as uh, discriminating. And, you know, ide identity, the identity group politics is not even based on the individual. <laughs> it's based on the group. So you're, you're even going against the base of liberalism in the first place, which is where it's, it's so confusing and contradictory. So I think a major kind of check of the foundations, a recheck of these foundations, I think is order because I think, you know, a lot of people are being denied the right to, the, to follow their conscience, I feel. I think you're being a bit harsh on not Western society. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought I was uh, being gentle. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Um, do there have any final um, inputs at all? Final, final inputs? Oh, okay. Um, oh, I, <laughs> ca caveat, I want to caveat that, right? Um, I've, been on, I've, I've been kind of a bit of a salpus. But um, there, obviously, there are some great aspects about you know about Western society, which I think is great, very great, because it. it, it I mean, I, obviously, from my perspective, it matches very much the Islamic conception. So, um, the right to debate in, in, in Islam, anything's up for debate. The first debate between Muslims and Christians was held by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his own mosque, and they rejected he was a prophet to his face. And after that, they were allowed to even pray in that mosque. So, the Christians were allowed to do Christian prayers in the mosque, because obviously it was late, and they maybe wanted to do prayers before going home. And that was that, and that, I see that that spirit of debate, you know, you know, in the West, you know, to some, to, you know, some degree. And I, and I think that's excellent. I think there's some great concepts. The, 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 <coughs> these all these liberal philosophers I, I kind of um, you know quoted, they had a great desire to, to see people not be oppressed, to see people not be miserable, and so on, not suffer. I'm not condemning them. I don't think they're evil or spawn of Satan. I don't none of that. I think they're actually desired good. I really think they desired good. But it, but as I said, just because people desire good doesn't necessarily mean that you know uh, what you come out with uh, might you know be a good thing or might be well might may not be malformed or any of these things so i said there's a lot of great things in, in in the west which i think islam in the west has a lot of commonalities but i'm just trying to highlight because obviously this debate is about human rights and and obviously the clashes where these clashes are why these clashes are and maybe to try to get rid of some myths about liberalism itself so we can take a, a kind of a, a good uh, in a kind of naked bare, you know, bare, you know, truth against uh, on, on liberalism what it is what it, and maybe what we should criticize about it or scrutinize about it or rethink or recheck and so on. I think that's always good and helpful to do that. So that's all I've been trying to do today. <coughs> I haven't just been Mr. Contrary. So. Um, okay, I've just could, I, could, I, could I just say, just say one thing very quickly? There was an article in the Badger, which I feel I have to comment on. Because <laughs> if you're giving us each a last, uh, last, uh, a last chance. Uh, it was an article about the Jewish student who uh, felt that his human rights were violated by the fact that uh, he was forced to take an exam on the Sabbath and the, um, 
equality um, um, the, the department, the appropriate department, the uh, progress and ex um, what's the department called? I'm not even a student here. So. Student progress and development. Is, is it, no, I have. Student I progress have. and assessment. The yeah. Student progress and assessment office weren't weren't accommodating him properly and. Uh, and uh, he got quite, uh, the, the, the article, I don't know if anyone here has read the article. You're law students, you don't read the badger. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he came across as, the article came across as sounding like the university were extremely unaccommodating. And uh, I want to reject that. The university have a very clear outlined um, criteria for, what, for how a Jewish student who observes the Sabbath should approach the university with clear dates at the end of the autumn term. You have to notify them to give them the time that they need to be able to accommodate you, and those um, those rights are, 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 are those, those rights and the policy guidelines relating to those rights are very very clear. The students seem to ignore those rights and then made a fuss. So uh, I think it's essential when we talk about human rights that we you know we, we 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 take our responsibility of looking at all of the details properly and not making a fuss about things that are. Uh, not, not fussed about. I hear often from Jewish students saying it's not fair that uh, Freshers Fair fell out on Yom Kippur. It's not fair that Yom Kippur fell out on Freshers Fair. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to live in a Western society, nobody's telling us to go away. Nobody's undermining, I hope. Nobody's undermining our rights. They happen to have a Freshers Fair. If you want, to, you want all the freebies in Freshers Fair, email all of the the, 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 the societies that you want their freebies from and say, unfortunately, it's Yom Kippur, I can't attend. I'm not asking you to change the date of freshness, but please keep me a doggy bag. I'm quite happy. <laughs> yeah, I think I'd just conclude by pointing out that I guess what the discussion has revealed, um, and you probably knew already, it's that these issues are not clear cut, certainly from a human rights perspective. There is no, this is obviously a human rights violation. This, this is how the European Court of Human Rights, for example, would decide such a case. Um, and what I d would say is just point out that it's not all about the European Court of Human Rights. The UN Human Rights Committee, um, which monitors the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which also has a right to freedom of religion, actually in quite a few recent cases on freedom of religion, has adopted a very different position to the European Court of Human Rights in determining what is necessary in a democratic society and what is proportional. Um, there are a few cases involving Sikh, the wearing of religious clothing and um, cases brought by Sikh applicants where the Human Rights Committee very clearly diverged from the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. And there are lots of interesting cases coming up. Pay attention. <laughs> That's quite okay. interesting. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I guess uh, liberalism has actually taken quite a bashing tonight. I think it's been quite misunderstood in uh, the way it's saying. The, the idea really behind it is that you're trying to balance lots of people's interests within a fair society. It's not taking one uh, over the other. It's, it's trying to maintain any, everybody's rights there are going to be um, points in which those clash and that's obviously the point of the legal system and that judges have that option to interpret the law to you know uh, mediate that they're not always going to get it right um, I was going to say something else as well oh yeah the idea especially particularly obviously this is uh, relating to um, uh, human rights uh, and religion obviously the right to a uh, religious is uh, having a religion, holding a belief, whatever that may be, is protected. But that really should be not at the expense uh, of other people's rights, not to be discriminated against, or not to have uh, any actions performed against their person. Um, but yeah, that's it. Um, I'd like to thank um, all the speakers for um, coming along today. Um, it was very, very, um, very revealing, and um, <laughs> I certainly learned a lot as well. A lot of um, current uh, issues that I'm now going to read up on because I feel like an ignoramus um, and um, just for taking the trip down here as well, thank you very much um, Abdullah, um, thank you for coming along um, at the last moment Rabbi um, as it was you as well. the last moment as you kept pushing it up I kept pushing it back, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you very much Dr Craig for um, constantly responding to my emails and being genuinely interested <laughs> and um, thank you Shane for um, introducing a new perspective on it as well um, and I'd like to thank um, everybody who's um, posed a question to the panel um, and everyone who came along and sat for an extra 40 minutes. Um, <laughs> we started out. 10 minutes later. Mm -hmm. uh, that's true, yeah. <laughs> hour and a half, hour and a half. Um, thank, you, thank you very much.